Bookcase TV is brought to you in part by Digital Film Academy. I am all set to start this new season, absolutely. Welcome back to a new season of Bookcase TV, our third season in a row. We have a great panel of guests. Hey, what's the next case? The next case. We lost uh, Freddy Carrier, our uh, journalist for the Book World segment. He decided suddenly he was going to retire. He apparently he moved to Argentina and he's writing his memoir. Good luck, Freddy, and we hope to hear from you and your memoir and have you perhaps as a guest on Bookcase TV in the future. Uh, we're starting a Bookcase TV Awards. It will be encompassing Book TV Awards and will be live on TV. Right. Well, we have uh, a new initiative as well. It's called the Bookcase TV Salon. Twice a month, we will have a guest author. You can either come and attend to the event or you can watch it from the comfort of your living room on your computer or TV because we'll be going live all over the world. Okay. Uh, during our break, we've been, do we've been doing a lot of digging and we have unveiled a lot of very interesting cases, notably young American writers standing up, changing the face of the publishing industry. We have a writer, for example, who was the first ever writer to obtain a traditional print contract separate from his ebook contract. Which we have another writer who's been selling millions of copies of her ebook alone as a self published book and then managed to get a print contract as well. I had to go to the BEA, the Book Expo America, to find them. So come with me. All right, bye. We have a new season starting, and this, today we are at BEA, where we're going to introduce you to new writers and their work, which are always fantastic. So stay tuned. Yeah. 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 Silos. Yes. yes. So I saw you um, a couple of magazines, uh, Writer's Digest magazines, yeah. and you are changing the face yeah. of the industry, publishing industry. How did you manage that well, so I, quickly? Yeah, I don't know that I'm actually doing all that. I, I'm following the footsteps of a okay. lot of people who have come before me. Um, I think it's from having the freedom to publish myself, um, to make uh, enough with my readership and working directly with them that I have options. I. When I had offers from publishers, I was able to say no until I got the kind of deal that I was looking for. Yeah, and also you were very particular about your choices because you could have gotten a massive deal on certain figures number yeah. on the table, but you actually uh, were more selective on that. Well, I, I think our digital rights are different than our print rights. Absolutely. The book is in print forever, and I want to be selling books 20 and 30 years from now. Your own books, yourself, yeah. self-publishing. The same book. Okay. So the, the book that I sold the print rights to Simon & Schuster 30 years from now, I can lower the price on it, I can put a new cover on it, I can do whatever I want. It won't be neglected, I'll always care about it. And I'll be earning on that book for the rest of my life. And the retire, you already retired, no? No, I'm still writing, but I do it full so, time. Let's talk about the, the writing process. How did you get started writing uh, sci-fi? Uh, well, I grew up reading a lot of science okay. fiction, but I write all genres. I write regular fiction and horror and young adult. Um, I, I got started uh, when I was pulled away from boating, which was my other career, okay. into the mountains of North Carolina, and I finally had time to devote to writing. I got a job in a bookstore, and I spent all my free time reading books, reading and uh, putting together books of my own, and then just started publishing them and, and kept doing it because I loved it. Okay. And then readers discovered my works. and. So Wool was the first publishing uh, trial for you, or you had something else before that? It was my first big success, big but success, I, okay. it was like my eighth or ninth title. So I'd written a lot before that. So what do you think that uh, that one different or people resonated with it and it did not with the others? No, I don't is know. It timing, is, is it it? a short story? It's a very dark story. Uh, it has a very surprise ending. But there's something about it that when people read it, they tell 10 other people about it. So it's, 
it's just been a, a word of mouth success. Oh yeah, was it like clever marketing? It was free, no? You put it in for I've I've done some free days. Now I've made it free, okay. um, but at the, the time I was just selling for ninety nine cents and. Uh, yeah, it wasn't really any marketing. I didn't put a link to it on my website when I published it. I just threw it out there and went back to my next uh, work. So how are you feeling about yourself these days? It's like a year later. Man, it's, uh, the, the, it's not a fairy tale, but it's got to be very strange. Place it's to very be. strange. I, it doesn't make sense. How do you I, deal with this? Uh, I, it's like watching it happen to someone else. Oh, really? So yeah. you don't feel like uh, connected no, with it? I, I, it doesn't seem real at all. Um, I, I'm. I'm supposed to be here as a bookseller, you know, with my old job, going around and making orders from publishers, and instead I'm here with my own book, and it's a New York Times bestseller, and none of that makes any sense to me. And uh, your family, how they reacted to it? Oh, they've been just so proud. Uh, my mom and my sister, my wife, my father, they've all been a big part of the process and just thrilled for me. So what's next? Uh, I've got the third and final book in the trilogy coming out okay. in August, and that'll uh, wrap up. Okay. It's Which called one is Dust. That? Dust, okay. And uh, you write by segments, or are you still doing a whole I'm, book at a time now? The third and final one will be just be one large novel one together, novel. yeah. My guest on Bookcase TV is? Hugh Howie, author of Wall. I was going to say that, oh, but you say for it. All right, we're good. But we'll cut right here. <laughs> Thanks. My second guest of the day is Bella Andre. Right? Yes. And the book is uh, The Look of Love, which should be published, which published already by Harlequin. Correct? Yes. It's out, it's out okay. this week. There is a fairy tale behind that book. Yes, correct? there is. The hero in The Look of Love is uh, a brother. He's got eight siblings, and uh, he's a photographer, and he finds a woman on the side of the road. Her car has gone into a ditch. Oh, I see. Okay. And he goes to save her, and he pretty much instantly falls in love with her. Parallel to the fairy tale in the book, yes. you have your own fairy tale with the publishing industry. I do have okay. my own fairy tale. I remember in January you were on the cover of the Publisher Weekly, PW, yes. as we call it. Yes. And that's a big uh, achievement, right? Very exciting. So how did I get started? You started to write novels. One day you woke up and said, I have to write a romance novel. Yeah, pretty much. I was a musician first. Oh, okay. And uh, one day two characters started to have a conversation in my head. And I wrote it down. Okay. And the next thing I knew, I had a book. I had spent so long as a musician thinking about love okay. that by the time I sat down to write a romance, it was kind of there. And I'm a, I'm a huge romance reader, too. Oh, okay. So, so you had, it was a background. It was already there in me. Okay. It was ingrained. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It okay. was. What yeah. attracts you about romance? What do you think? Is uh, there a scarcity of it in life? Or you, uh, you don't have it in your life? Or? I just love everything <laughs> about it. I do have it in my oh, okay, life. Good. Uh, and I, I love everything about love. Okay. I, I just, I, you know, they're the books I've always read since I was a teenager. They're the books I read now. Um, I love writing about love stories. You know, I okay. mean, I just, it's, it's fantastic. There you have a manuscript, then what happened? So with the Sullivan books, with this book, I decided to put out um, an ebook. Um, and I sold over a million copies of my ebooks. So and which book was that? Um, it was all of them. Oh, well it was, okay. I've, yeah, so I've, I've actually now put out the first eight as ebooks. And Harlequin approached me and just said, we are very, very excited about this and we would love to print these. So they fell in love with you? They did. Actually, well. we, 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 yeah, we have a romance. When did you decide to um, drop music and to go into writing? Uh, how, long ago, yeah. how long ago was that? So about eight years ago, I realized I had to make a decision between touring and putting out albums. Um, and I toured all over the world. Um, you played what? You, you were I played guitar, guitar, I played guitar, piano, guitar. Um, and I, I sang. I wrote songs with hit songwriters in Los Angeles okay. and uh, Nashville. And I just, I loved books more. That was what it came down to. So I, I literally stopped doing music completely, and I have never regretted it for one day. Eight books, eight years? How does that work? Eight books, two years. Eight books, two years. That's... So I have put out four books a year. Um, when do you sleep? Never. All right. <laughs> I never sleep. That's what does uh, love does to you. You just keep you awake, right? That's right. Okay. No, but it's, uh, it's, uh, can you sustain that uh, sort of output? Um, and why doing so many? That's my, I'm sort of at my best when I'm working at that kind of pace, I okay. think. I've captured a, a big chunk of the digital reading market, and with Harlequin bringing the books to print, I mean, that's really a brand new market. 
and the, the, what, what they've done with it is exceptional. We are reaching so many new readers with it. You know, I don't want to stop now. I got to yeah, keep course, going. Yeah. You have to. I do. And you have to make it interesting. Yeah, and you know, I think the key is that it has to be interesting to me. If it's interesting yeah. to me, it's going to be interesting to readers. So I like my yeah. characters to have a real, um, a real path. Like it's not like all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're like, I'm fine. No, it's not like that. We kind of get yeah. there in pieces. You think uh, writing was a way to fix yourself? <laughs> what? I need fixing? No. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I don't. No, no one yeah, does. no, clearly, none of us do. My next guest is Kurthy Zand. I hope I say that right. Yes. Close. Close enough. Right, let's try again. Kurthy. Kothy. Kothy Zand. And the first book, The Neverlist, published by Viking. Viking. Pamela Dorman Books. That's right. So this is your first novel? Yes, it is. And uh, I don't believe you're a first-time writer, are you? I am a first-time writer. The Neverlist, what's uh, what it's all about? The Neverlist is about uh, Sarah Farber, who is a 31-year-old woman who was abducted uh, along with her best friend when she was in college. And the book is set 10 years later when she's still struggling to recover from the trauma of the experience and she's also trying to recover from the grief because her best friend didn't make it out. And so now the, uh, her abductor is sending her taunting letters from jail, and she's got to go back to where it all began in order to uh, you know, both solve a mystery and also to really face her own demons. Did you have to face your own demon writing the novel? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, def basically, I, I wrote this novel because I was very inspired by a lot of the uh, stories of captivity. and. Um, I just thought, how do they get over them? Because I know that in my own life, whatever much smaller personal traumas I've had, I know how difficult it can be to overcome them. So I just think that here are these women who have overcome, who have lived through my worst nightmare and had to figure out how to integrate that experience into their life. And uh, so, you know, I went, I, I obviously have never been abducted, have never been held captive, but uh, it was a very intense emotional experience writing it and trying to connect with that. So what was the process like? Well, I, I had a, I, I really felt that I knew the character, and um, so once I had the idea for the character, I, I had the idea for the beginning of the book, and then I had the idea for the end of the book. And um, every day I would take a three-mile walk, and I would just think about the characters down in the cellar, or you know, I would imagine them, and and I wasn't plotting the book, but just imagining them interacting, so I feel like I really got to know the characters. And then my writing time was from 5 to 6 a.m. every morning. So I used like what I like to call the Graham Greene method. I had to do 500 words a day, and um, I had to do that five days a week. And then I gave myself a little reward system, which is that if I hit 10,000 words in any calendar month, I could take the rest of the month off. Oh, really? And I really, and I really believed that if I ever, ever missed a word count, then I was not going to finish the book. So I never did. I just, you know, I was very, very disciplined, and that's how I was able to, to get it written. So the story is a story of fiction. You made it up, right? Correct. The, where was the uh, inception? What the idea that germinated that you took on? Was it something in the newspaper, or what was inspiration? Yeah, well, I, well, I um, for years, have followed the story of um, abductions and, and okay. captivity and was very struck by uh, the stories of Elizabeth Fritzel, Natasha Campouche, J.C. Lee Dugard, Sabine Dardenne, and they affected me very deeply. And because um, I just thought, how are these women surviving afterwards? And, and um, you know, I would read all of their stories long after the initial splashy headlines to see how were they doing and how did they get through it. And I read all of their autobiographies to the extent that they wrote them. And um, I was just very moved by their strength. And I thought, how, how can you keep going? How do you survive after this experience? So I was moved to have, I wanted to have a, a, a character who had been through that and who was really, you know, the, the, the mystery that she's solving is as much one of her own survival as it is the actual you know, the crime that she's trying to solve. Would you like to know what's next? By any chance. What's next? Welcome back to Bookcase. And our guest now is Lisa Rene Jones. The new book, Being Me. So, is that no, book number 47, 57? Where, where are Actually, we? Actually, it might be close to 
40 ish, I 40 -ish. think. I've lost track. I don't count. Okay. So, first you started writing erotica novels or mysteries. So where, how, how did you get started? My very first book I ever wrote was uh, a romantic suspense. So, that's romantic always suspense. been okay. where my heart is that suspense okay. mystery element. Um, and I radiated towards straight romance simply because that's where opportunity presented itself. But my heart was always in suspense. Do you feel like romance is a bit of mystery in it? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, it's, I like to think that my books are 50 50. What sort of mind does it take? Or what someone do you, do you have, so that you can come up with so many stories? Almost everything that happens to me shows up in a book. Um, in fact, I just went to Paris to write book three in this series, and be, and I'm so glad I did. I used every single thing I did there. Do you feel like you uh, you've grown over time with your novel? Yes, in many ways. In many um, ways okay. I've grown as a writer from a craft standpoint, of course. So what about as a person? As a person, um, I think all those years I had in business helped me a lot. Um, but I also think stepping away from business and living outside an 80-hour work week helped me to explore the other aspects of life as well. But um, this series, the Inside Out series, is a very dark, erotic series. And I had to go to some uncomfortable places. But I felt like the scenes that made me the most uncomfortable turned out to be some of the best scenes in the book because I think that they're going to hit that place in readers where they go, oh, well, I want to you know, feel that, but I don't want to feel that. I want to know that, but I don't really want to know that. It's like and you don't want to look at it, but you do. Yeah. You have to, yeah. I mean, if I don't feel passionate when I write it, if I don't feel like I've pushed my limits, then how are the readers going to have that kind of emotional journey? This is, you talk about series, you know, do you know in advance when you get started that this character is going to need four, five, or six books, or, or is it going to be dead after the first one? I knew those characters so well by the time I sat down to write them. Um, and initially, I did see it as a three book series, but it just, the characters, there were things that kept going, and there were secondary characters that led me other places, so it, it is a bigger arc now than it was before. So self-publishing, you've done some of that. Indie publishing has been, you know, a, a phenomenal, exciting thing for Blessing all of us. For you, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and also I think that readers have spoken through indie. They say we want um, real life stories. With indie, the reason it's done so well is that readers have responded to, guess what? People die, people have affairs, people have things happen, and it's not that they don't want happily ever after, but they want a realistic happily ever after. I can go through fire and trauma, and I can survive on the other side. So I think that because in Indy we were allowed to go there, readers started reconnecting with stories they'd stopped connecting with. Oh, I was going to walk off with your mic. You can't get it on me. You can't get it off me. That's how it works. <laughs> So are you happy now? Would you like to know what's next? What's next, boy? Now let me tell you what's next. Okay, boy. And good evening, I'm Frederick Collier. I'm the new host of Book World. Uh, tonight, let's talk about shindigs. Do you dig your shindigs? Do you know how complicated it is to organize shindigs with your friends, whether you have 10 of them or 100 of them? Well, we met someone who can help you do that task. He, in fact, he created a company called shindig.com, where through a platform on the internet, you can videotape and you can have live events with anyone in the world. What was the story behind the, the, the platform itself? Well, I was actually sitting with my, uh, with my son, and he was on the computer making friends with people he would never meet. Okay. And I wanted to be social online, actually with some old college friends, and we were trying to arrange it, and I couldn't. And I said, what's wrong with this picture? You know, the only way to be social online is to be six years old. And if you really want to have a meaningful social experience, it doesn't exist online. And I began to be interested in the question as to why. I went through a whole long process and really realized that the way for social interaction to happen is that people needed to be free. They need to be free to interact just like they do at this, you know, book expo. They see, they mingle and they go in and out of conversation and uh, 
That's what I created with Shindig. It's a video chat platform where rather than being locked into one conversation, yeah. people can move around a room and they can talk to this person and see someone they know and talk to that person. Right. So I can be in Miami, right? interviewing you in New York, right? and people in Los Angeles or Beijing or Paris can participate. That's the idea. Right? They can, the person in Los Angeles and Paris can be talking together and right. saying, I love what the presenter is saying. I love what Fred is, you know, what's being said, or I don't. And so they can, everyone can participate and be social in a very free and intuitive way. Okay. So it's all the dynamics of a physical event yeah. on the web. So what's, why books, why not music, for example? Because you were in the music business for a long time. Right. Well, right. we started with things that were kind of uh, uh, very big touch points for people who have lots of passion. We're just now moving into music. We have a handful of very big music events starting next week. Okay. And music was actually one of the things I had in mind that artists could do release parties or, or meet and greets with fans and all kinds of special events online and, and give fans really special access to, to them. So music we're really excited about. Uh, we're also working a lot with uh, online learning. Uh, we're working a lot with radio stations. We're doing online nightclubs with great DJs spinning music and people being able to be social in Shindig and video chat. And we're also beginning working with magazines and other media companies. But this is really a new medium. One part TV talk show, sure. one part radio call-in, and one part social networking event. And it's really up to now the talent to make it their own and make it really sing. Still got live from Shindig. Wish you all the best. Thank you and so much. And I'm hoping that you get where you want. I never thought about it, but I'm actually use the platform to organize my own wedding. Even though it's a lot of work, and if I need some help, I will know who to call. Steve Gottlieb from Shindig.com. And that is it for us tonight at Book World TV. Thank you. So welcome back to the pick of the week, the first one of the season, and I would like to start the season with uh, Wise Men, very good title, by a young writer called Stuart Nadler. Uh, I believe he's under 35. His first novel, he talks about um, a very wealthy lawyer who has a son called Hilly, and who falls in love with a caretaker's daughter who happens to be black. The story is set in the 1950s in Cape Cod, which is my favorite uh, part of the country, but you can only imagine the consequences. So. The momentum of the novel is based on the regret and the story moved from there. If you want to find out the outcome, how it resolved itself, it's multi-generational stories, Wise Men by Stuart Nadler. Since I'm talking about regrets from Stuart Nadler, let's move straight into a second novel, which is also based on uh, forgiveness and regrets, uh, The Carriage House by Louisa Hall. Uh, first time writer as well, I think I believe she's under 30 in this one. Uh, fantastic novel, probably my favorite one of the season. It talks about three sisters who are left pretty much to their own device and the family support and validation after the father suffers from a massive stroke and the mother begins showing sign of Alzheimer. The carriage has become the metaphor for the three of them where they can find forgiveness for lost lives and they're trying to save the house and save the father's life and recuperate the past and make peace with himself. So The Carriage House by Louisa Hall, fantastic first novel. My next book is completely different in tone. It's very humoristic and if you like uh, Lena Durham's uh, Girls series on HBO, this is the literary version. Harry Smile, Iris has free time. Talks about someone growing up, what's, what's like for a first time writer under 30. Iris just graduated from college what it's like once you graduate. Reality check. Reality catches up with you. Can you deal with it? Not necessarily well. So she feels like blacking out, but she's prefer picking out because she's a girl. And when she talks about literature, she seems to come to herself, but literature in the 21st century is not a great way to make a living. 
read it, it's funny, it's very engaging, and it's moving very, very fast. Harry smile, Harry's at free coin. And my last book for this first program is The Night Circus by Erin Morgenstein, who's been the bestseller for last year. It's coming on paperback, but if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's a story of a traveling circus, a love story between two people, an impossible love. But I believe this what makes a book so successful is because it's a metaphor for what's happening in our world and the internet where we are completely disconnected from reality and we live in our mind. So this is full of trippy psychedelic tricks and if you don't know what a maze made out of cloud is, well this is your chance to find out about it. Erin Morgenstein, The Night Circus. Good night. Good enough for you now? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I